Okay, John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having uh, me, Anthony. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to uh, finally sit down, Zoom to Zoom, virtual to virtual face <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> for now. So before we get started, I wanted to first actually thank you for your service. Uh, well, thank you. To the country. <laughs> um, so you, I, I find this super interesting. Um, you were actually a, a paratrooper, right? And yes. you, you did missions in Egypt? Yeah. So uh, 82nd Airborne, there's a, a rotation in the Sinai, actually. So right in between Egypt and Israel. And so we're okay. there for six months. And uh, it's kind of quirky. It's a multinational peacekeeping rotation there. And we were there with a battalion of Fijians and a battalion of Colombians. So that wow, was, wow. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of interesting stories I could share in that experience. <laughs> um, that is uh, impressive. Now, how, how many times um, would you say you've jumped out of a plane? Uh, I could count. Uh, there were about 35 jumps that I was involved wow. in. Yeah. Jeez, that's a lot. Do you still parachute for fun? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, you've had your share. Yeah, and, I, I think um, I, I definitely got pulled in by watching one of those recruiter DVDs, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I picked the uh, MOS, which is Eleven Bravo, One Papa, for based on that DVD. I thought it looked super uh, exciting, but uh, kind of regretted my decision after the first jump. But you know, it oh is what God. it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, still, I mean, not many people do that. Not many people serve. So thank you again for doing that. So, John, I thought one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show was because I, um, I don't know any other companies that are doing what you're doing. And development, especially in Los Angeles, is booming. It has been booming. It's going to continue. And we're seeing a, a tremendous transition from old properties, old land and into new opportunities. So I wanted, I wanted to talk about that. I thought that was really interesting and I didn't see anybody else doing anything like it. Development in Los Angeles is very complex. It's very complicated. It's a very long process. It's very bureaucratic. And I, I personally, I work with a lot of developers. I work on development deals myself. So I'm familiar with it to a certain regard. I'm not a developer, I will say. Uh, I've never developed anything, but I've been through the process with clients of mine. So I wanted to ask first, where, where did this idea for brick and work come from? Yeah, so um, uh, I started off my career as a mortgage loan broker, but eventually I got my broker license. Um, I also did some real estate transactions here and there for just you know clients of mine that uh, were my borrowers. But eventually I had clients kind of stump me years back when they were in the middle of an escrow for three lots attached in Koreatown. And they had asked me, Hey, so uh, you know, there's this kind of development boom going on even within Koreatown. So they had asked, um, you know, what do you think a developer would kind of value or pay uh, for this uh, for these properties if we went ahead and entitled them? And so that question led me on to kind of this path where I didn't know. And so the first thing I did was reach out. To consultants. So I reached out to an architect uh, and land use consultant, Alex Irvine, who eventually uh, ended up being my partner and uh, kind of a financial guy uh, as well. So we got them all in a conference room and, um, you know, obviously all of them require a retainer and kind of an engagement to, to kind of get to that answer. And that answer uh, was too open-ended was what we realized after that meeting was you kind of have to know specifically what you're looking at as far as the development is concerned to then get a better idea of what that would be worth to a different developer. Uh, so um, I just felt that that was, and, and the cost I think was probably upwards of tens of thousands to kind of engage everybody. 
to get to that answer. And so I, you know, after that meeting, um, I just, I just felt that there was kind of this void or this lack of an ability to get this answer quickly. Um, that, that's it, just the initial due diligence, if that makes sense. So, you know, my clients weren't necessarily going to build it. So they didn't want to take, you know, this all the way down to that path, but they just kind of wanted to roughly know, you know, what are the metrics? What am I looking at? What can you build? And so, yeah, that, that really started the journey. And obviously I had a follow-up meeting with Alex and we kind of shared uh, the same idea, but on different perspectives. I was more on the broker end and my partner, Alex, was more on the developer end where his mm -hmm. clients kept, you know, pinging him and saying, okay, Alex, you know, you're working on this one project. For me, it's going great, but I have like three others that I'm considering. Can you give me your quick analysis on it? So obviously he wanted to kind of create some sort of uh, website or ability to tackle those requests as they were kind of interrupting uh, what he was doing, which is really um, getting that uh, project fully entitled with the city. Right. And how long have you guys been at it now? I would say about getting close to two years. Okay. Two years. And what, what kind of results have you guys seen? The last two years have been pretty good. I mean, everything's been pretty good pre uh, COVID. So what, what kind of uh, results have you guys seen and who, who do you find is using it the most? Great question. So um, I think at the beginning, we obviously did pick up some early adopters and some top producing teams and different brokerages all around kind of Los Angeles. And we initially focused on the city of Los Angeles and then gradually started to expand that out to different municipalities. Um, now we cover all of Los Angeles County, Orange County, and looking to expand to San Diego. But um, we built this for brokers because, um, you know, my um, thought process behind that was, you know, obviously developers know this, but this is kind of a shortcut for developers. So it does provide uh, somewhat of value, but I just mm -hmm. felt that the brokers were the ones that were involved in prospecting uh, to find sites and assemblages for developers, or they had listings that they needed information to market toward developers. Uh, so I just felt that the adoption uh, and also the value add was going to be uh, more toward brokers. So we, you know, kind of had to pivot. I went out to residential brokerages thinking that they might want this information, easy access mm -hmm. to kind of start to dabble in commercial real estate. But mm -hmm. uh, I think I held a couple lunch and learns, got glazed looks and just <laughs> scratching of the head. And so um, we kind of pivoted and said, okay, this is more in the realm of commercial real estate than, than mm -hmm. residential. And so, yeah. And then I guess up until this point, we picked up, you know, a lot, uh, uh, even more, uh, uh, you know, top producing brokers. And then um, developers started even forwarding emails. So, you know, the developers are always getting emails on properties for development sites, but for them, they found value in Brickwork so that they were forwarding me an email going, hey, I need Brickwork reports on, you know, this uh, listing that this broker is pitching me or emailing me. So then those brokers were like, what is Brickwork? So that mm -hmm, kind of started mm -hmm. to snowball. And uh, okay. but yeah, so that's, that's kind of been the progression. So John, so somebody, I'm a, I'm a listing broker, for example, and I see this property and I realize, uh, gosh, this could be a good development site. So I call you up, say, yeah. John, here's my property, one, two, three main street. And what could be built here? Mm -hmm. Is that what I say to you? And then what do you turn around to me and, and in how many days? So we stick to one business day. I think um, kind of my partner's staff or that uh, my partner's firm is also uh, kind of supporting the requests. And so, and we've picked up some more analysts. So about one business day, what the report covers has been a work in progress. So we initially wanted to provide some quick calculations, floor area ratio, your net buildable envelope, how many stories, what parking, and you know, is this within a transit oriented community zone? TLC or uh, would it default back to the state's density bonus program? But we've progressed. So uh, I think a lot of the top producing brokers started to ask more and more questions, wanted more involvement because what they were um, facing were developers now 
interested in their properties, but had a whole host of land use questions, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started fielding those questions. We started getting on conference calls with those developers to answer those questions. So we're kind of delivering more than the initial land use uh, report. We're also providing some consulting behind that. And uh, obviously, yeah, that's for the pro members, which just has been geared more toward commercial brokers, where it's a paid subscription, uh, a 250 a month uh, to be a part of that. Right. So if you're selling old property here in, in, in I don't know, what any county, uh, Orange, LA, San Diego, they, they should look at this, give you a call and see what other potentials are here besides just what the uh, existing use is. Is that correct? Right. And we looked okay. a little bit deeper into the code too. So there's another part of this I didn't mention, which is uh, trying to figure out what kind of hurdles you're not seeing. So there might be a Q condition on it, a D limitation. There might be some weird nuance in the specific plan that then counteracts what the zoning is uh, inherently telling you. And this is quite frequent or quite common in, in LA, unfortunately. So we're trying to get to that quicker, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. at a lower cost point. But um, we're also now starting a new partnership with an architecture firm here locally in LA. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be announcing that very soon. I'm sorry, I can't announce it here as right yet. But yep. what we're providing is what's called content massing. And what that means is now, great, we provide development potential. You could build up to 150 units, but it's a skinny lot in downtown. Is that physically feasible? No, that's the job of the architect to come in and actually start to massive and give you a highest and best use or uh, you know, scenario one or two or three that you could kind of pick, or pick through based on the actual physical massing of it. We're yeah. partnering with them to provide that again at a lower cost point than going to them directly for this. So that's gonna be launched here in a few weeks. And it's gonna be through uh, obviously, initially getting the report on the site through us, which is step one, but then that next step would just be, okay, well, I wanna provide a little more value to the developer where they could go themselves to the architect, but the cost point still is gonna be much higher if they go direct versus what we just created, which is like kind of a, a slimmer down version of that massing model. Right. Now, in your reports, do you guys talk to the city, the planning department, or is it all uh, research that you guys find and dig up for the, your, uh, your clients? Great question. So, yeah, um, we do a combination of everything. So some sites, we don't necessarily have to dig too much. and um, They're very vanilla, pretty much. There's not going to be any uh, you know, impediment to what you're trying to do there. But a lot of times, there's, um, again, rules that... I remember one site for one user requested in Miracle Mile and they were like, there's like 20 plus Q conditions and they were all different. I've been so involved we, in one for a long time and the Q <laughs> is crazy. Like, it's so complicated sometimes you can't, it's so hard to figure out these Q conditions. Absolutely. So they came to us and they were like, well, which one applies here? And we were like, we don't know. And so <laughs> we had to use my partner Alex's contact, which is kind of, higher up in the planning department to kind of get through that question quickly. So we obviously use the leverage of my partner's land use firm with the contacts he has at the cities. Okay. A lot of them are also ex city planners. I realize that when you have that kind of call by someone that worked exactly where you were at, it's just yeah. way faster to get to that answer than if you were some outside party trying to reach them directly. For sure. So, okay, couple, couple, couple questions. Um, what would you recommend to prospective developers in, in California, for example? Um, what, what's your take on uh, the development landscape, you know, going forward? Yeah. Um, so we are in constant contact with developers right now because we're um, now starting to create a plan for them to come in and they really want um, uh, off-market properties. But then we also pull them and say, okay, well, what are you looking for post like this pandemic, right? What kind of verticals, redevelopment? And some of the developers have shared, well, this is the perfect time to redevelop, right? That's, that's just, 
you know, uh, unfortunately, there are some sectors that aren't going to be performing, and that's actually um, uh, probably going to come to head more early next year than it is currently. And so, yeah. you know, retail shopping strips with small businesses that aren't, you know, doing so well, or restaurants, or they're not, you know, anchored by national chains are going to be probably at some owner's portfolio, uh, not performing and at the bottom. So they're going to be looking at highest and best use. And obviously the developer is going to want to try to joint venture with them or just um, look at that site as an outright sale. Hotels, I read an article even today that that is going to start to um, rapidly deteriorate as far as, uh, you know, paying and non-performing. And I think some hotel on Rodeo was uh, featured there, LA Times this morning. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, it is, uh, that's the thing. But I think at the very least, the developers are very opportunistic and, you know, they're building for two, three, five years down the road, or if not more. So they're not necessarily pinned down or concerned about what's going on now. Of course, they have to look at what's now, but then they're also kind of planning ahead. So those are a few of the conversations that we've had with uh, developers recently and what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see, uh, I get calls still. I think people are still looking for opportunities and I think there's a, a little hesitation right now, but I think in the long haul, um, I think LA specifically is still gonna be a place for development, is still gonna be a place for reposition, is still going to be a place for going vertical. I think our city as a whole has a long way to go to create more density and people are not stopping living here and coming here and we just have so much to offer. So I'm seeing it already in places where people never expected multifamily development along some of the, you know, Pico Boulevards and Washington Boulevards, for example, that used to just yeah. be, you know, single level mm -hmm. warehouses or retail, and it's already happening. So I think you guys are well positioned to offer a lot of value to agents and, and developers uh, going forward. Do you guys consider yourself a prop tech firm? Yes, uh, more specifically kind of uh, right now, commercial real estate prop tech versus maybe residential, but um, yeah. And so what, what do you, what do you um, are you excited about any, anything in that realm? Um, prop tech has been picking up a lot in the last few years. Commercial real estate historically has been behind the eight ball in right. technology though. I've seen Agreed. a lot of advances um, you know, in the last decade and it's great to see, and there's so many small startups coming around and, and, and bigger companies that are doing some, some things, but we're, we're, we're catching up. Um, mm -hmm. what, um, what are you excited about in the prop tech world? Oh yeah. So, uh, I'm involved in it kind of heavily, um, just as a startup and, you know, we, we still have to, Kind of raise capital while we're growing so i'm always kind of hyper aware of what's going on but it's super exciting i think uh the buzzword of maybe five six seven years ago was fintech and i by all means i think that's still an important space and you know with the blockchain and crypto you know it, moving forward it's gonna it's gonna develop but yeah like you had mentioned commercial real estate i mean just as an asset class right is in the trillions and uh <laughs> kind of the technology around it is still, still antiquated. And so I think there's a lot of exciting companies out there. Obviously, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of Reonomy out of New York, and they're kind of trying to disrupt a little bit of what CoStar is doing with, with data and some analytics mm -hmm. that they're providing. Um, I know this isn't commercial real estate, but Open Door just announced that they're going public through a SPAC, I think 4.8 billion. And so that's mm. kind of, uh, out there as well. But then there's also um, built world construction tech, which I'm excited for because construction, if you're talking about <laughs> right, disruption. And so I remember a company called Plan Grid where uh, I was in a networking event in downtown and they were just getting up and running. And now they're like uh, pretty established. I think they provide kind of uh, everybody from the general to the subs on one plan or one set of blueprints on an iPad that you could kind of collaborate on as you move forward on the construction side. So yeah, a lot of exciting stuff going on. 
Yeah, I think so too. And I think we're only going to see more and more. And I think it's going to make uh, things easier uh, for people. And I, at least I know in my end of the world, um, you know, having information is key and mm -hmm. it's, a li it's definitely easier to get information today. And it makes uh, doing deals a little funner and easier. So I'm excited for the industry as a whole as well. So um, John, just real quick, you're, um, you're in commercial real estate now, but you haven't always been on the technology side. You mentioned lending a little while ago. Was that your, was that your, how long did you do that? And was that really what led you into this? Yeah. So uh, after the army, I think I jumped into kind of retail banking. So I worked at a old Washington mutual branch on ninth and Hill in downtown. And, okay. Uh, oh, that one was pretty awesome because downstairs had the, old safety deposit boxes with, yep. the, you know, uh, so yeah, I started doing that and then I got into mortgages and I still do loans and um, uh, definitely commercial, residential, uh, that kind of stuff. But I think more than kind of what I was doing, I, I, I think I adhered to kind of, um, you know, working for the client and, um, you know, I was always kind of trying to evolve and, and, and get a little better. So mortgages where I started with, and then I started uh, trying to understand commercial and commercial definitely um, uh, was, uh, was more difficult to understand because there's so many facets with kind of the lending industry. Is it owner occupied? Is it investment? And then you have obviously Fannie Freddie's that provide multifamily uh, loans on that space. And then you have higher up on the capital stack. So uh, that was all interesting and fascinating. But um, eventually, yeah, um, I think development, um, one of the reasons why um, was uh, based on trying to come through for a client. But then beyond that, obviously, the, uh, the ripple effects it has with kind of the uh, housing crisis, what we're experiencing, and you had mentioned in Los Angeles, I think we need to get better with homelessness. Like there's, it, but it's not just one kind of uh, solution. I've, I've uh, listened and read a lot of articles with different people with different opinions. I think everyone uh, kind of has a solution. It's just, it's more comprehensive than, than what people are making it out to. So. For sure. A um, couple, couple last questions, John. Do you have a favorite place in Los Angeles or a favorite thing to do when, uh, if there's no coronavirus floating around. <laughs> uh, yeah, like what would you, well, what is one of your, uh, one, one or two of your favorite places in LA? I grew up in LA. Uh, I grew up in Koreatown. So I, you know, I went through John Burroughs Junior High and then I got bussed around to every uh, charter oh, wow. school, magnet school. So yeah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I would say Korean barbecue uh, in Chapman ah. specifically, yeah. <laughs> Wait, where, where? Uh, Chapman Plaza, um, there okay. is a Korean barbecue what I would recommend if you haven't been. Uh, it's called KHD and it's kind of the abbreviation for a, a, a very famous Korean comedian that loved to eat. So he started his own uh, uh, barbecue chain. And so okay. uh, that's a favorite of mine. So I, I just love that I could take uh, clients out there, you know, and even my partner, when we first started uh, Brickwork, funny enough, I have a story is uh he's never been to korean barbecue and i was like oh we got to remedy this right away so i think the, one of the first things we did was go to chapman pasta and had love korean barbecue. So. i love that uh i've never heard of that one um but i'm gonna i'm writing it down and uh, <laughs> i hope to get out there my my local spot was chosun oh was the, the classic yeah absolutely. yeah the classic it's around forever yeah, absolutely. Upscale. Pretty close to my office, and awesome. uh, we we do uh, lunches and client lunches there. It, it's still great, it, oh, you know. Yeah. It, Hands yeah. Down. yeah. Okay. I think you know doing Korean barbecue is, is such a great experience, and uh, yes, for those who've never tried it, uh, definitely uh, get out there. Are they? Um, is that one open, by the way, right now? Are yeah, you... um, actually, there's one locally by me. I'm in uh, kind of close to Buena Park, and I think they're. I think from what I'm hearing now, of course, I haven't been up to LA since it started in March. So, uh, but uh, I have friends that live there and they, I think everyone's kind of adhering to the outdoor di dining, especially Korean barbecue. So they're making some makeshift, I think they're cooking it inside, unfortunately, and bringing it out. So you can't have that kind of experience, right. but everyone's still kind of 
hanging out outside outdoor dining and and soju <laughs> yeah so, entire yeah. experience yeah yeah okay and one more question so you're an LA native I'm an LA native and uh there, I feel like there's not a lot of us out there but it's, <laughs> it's, uh so LA look I I I live work out here raising a family I love Los Angeles as uh do you so if we could ask our listeners um something they could do to make Los Angeles a better place what would you like to ask them to do you know I I, I don't I didn't mean this answer to kind of uh follow uh, a popular buzzword uh you know that gets brought up a lot but um like you had mentioned I love LA um and I think post pandemic uh we're seeing this ex problem being exasperated accelerated you know homelessness right and so um you know some of the friends that live actually in the city right now and I'm kind of down here in orange county but uh so they're telling me oh it is so much worse like you know now you're seeing kind of those makeshift tents and camps in the middle of the embankment and they're just growing. And so, you know, I, I have to say a part of what, why we started Brickwork was obviously, look, without being political, without trying to get on either side, you know, it's just, you know, uh, business mechanics where if you provide more inventory, right, I think it broadens the choice of more, it brings the uh, affordable, right housing uh and rents down so so that's kind of what we uh want but i think what i would ask is for everyone to kind of look at well what else is the solution it's not purely housing i think it's also kind of the people out there have gone through some you know traumatic events and uh you know they need rehabilitation they need kind of retooling to be a part of the the job force again. So, I mean, it's a multifaceted problem, but I think what had happened previously was just, you know, people in LA just kind of, yeah, nodded the problem away, you know, like, yeah, it's something, but I'm sure someone's going to get to that. And now we're seeing, no, I think one thing that this pandemic has taught us is that whatever you put aside is just going to come back in full force. So I think we really have to deal with this um uh where you have to kind of reach out to your local council member you've got to kind of reach um figure out what organizations are out there doing something and then you know be involved and lend a hand that's great um so important to be involved and to care uh john where can people find you or learn more about brick and work yeah so our website brickwork dot LA. Um, we're on Instagram and LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn, it just makes more sense than Instagram because always have trouble with our marketing, uh, you know, team trying to figure out what exciting posts that we could bring people toward on zoning and land use and <laughs> development. So, yeah. you know, we just, we figured pretty renderings would be, <laughs> would be better than nothing. So, but yeah, uh, uh I think, uh, in, uh, LinkedIn has been really effective for us where a lot of brokers and developers have reached out even with the question what is brickwork can you you know show me a demo and we've been doing that more recently so I'm more than happy to do that that's great are you making presentations to uh, companies to brokerage companies yeah so um, I, I think I shared we picked up uh, you know um, Lori over at Lori Lessig Bauer at CBRE so um, I think uh, uh, management has reached out to us. This was pre-COVID though, right? And wanted uh, uh, us to kind of do these demos maybe in office and in the different branches for CBRE. And all of a sudden this pandemic hit and kind of do that for a loop. So, I mean, we're still open to doing them on Zoom, something like this. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Well, very interesting. Uh, we might get you involved with our firm to make a virtual presentation. Because uh, we do we do a lot of that uh, kind of stuff and or come across a lot of those opportunities, so it'd be interesting to share. John, um, any any final words that you want to leave the the audience with? <laughs> Look, Anthony, thank you so much for the invitation. I was like uh, super nervous in uh, coming and do this, and I would say because I was doing these podcasts, and after maybe a, a few of them, 
you know, you do kind of get used to it. So I, I was, I stopped getting nervous for my guests, but I got really nervous <laughs> being on yours because I did a little research and I saw how long you've been doing these podcasts and how, you know, almost every guest has been a market leader, uh, thought leader all over, you know, that had, uh, you know, their kind of uh, say in, in what's going on in different topics. I just didn't feel like I, I was a part of that list. So, but well, thank you for the invitation. It's no, you're very great. welcome. And I, and I thought it was important. I thought you guys are having a, a positive impact in our city. And I, I just wanted to help get the word out about what you do. There's not a lot. I find it very interesting. I find the technology aspect interesting. And and the little impact you're helping to improve the lives um, of agents or developers or helping the city grow. I think that's really interesting and, and great work so far. So thank you so much, John, uh, for being here with me. And I appreciate it and uh, look forward to speaking again. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks.